Uh, my name is Rob Tinkham. I've worked with Gusmer for six and a half years. I work in R&D filtration, new product development. Today I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, wine filtration as it relates to filter sheets and uh, lenticular filter stacks. So today we're going to talk about some filtration basics and what your goals are. Uh, depth filtration mechanisms, how you're actually removing those particles. Uh, we'll talk about how filter sheets are used and lenticular uh, stacks as well. And then we'll talk about key operating parameters that you guys should really be concerned about when you're doing your depth filtration. So generally goals of filtration, you're looking at solids reduction, uh, visual clarity, microbial stability, and sterile packaging. The main goal is particle removal. Is filtration the only way? No, uh, there's other ways to remove particles. You guys probably all use some racking, and gravity just letting every, uh, all your particles fall out and take your wine off the top. To improve racking, you can add some fining agents that's gonna pull some of your soluble stuff out, uh, some proteins, uh, and then you use racking, same idea. You just may be more effective. You can also use decanters and centrifuges. You're using the centrifugal force to kind of push your solids off to the side and you remove the, the liquid off of that. A typical winery is gonna use multiple different ways to remove those particles. So what type of particles should you be concerned about? There's two main ones, it's rigid and soft. Rigid particles that you guys will probably encompass are, encounter are DE and fibers, help you with your removal. Uh, tartrate crystals, you want to get rid of those. Sand and grit, come in with your grapes. You want to get, get those remo removed from your wine. There's also some fining agents that are rigid. You probably use carbon or bentonite, help uh, with some protein removal. And if you're using any oak alternatives, you also want to remove that from your wine. You don't want to have your, your oak, any oak chips running into your sterile filtration, uh, sterile membranes. So some soft particles to be concerned about are colloidal proteins or colloidal phenolics, lipids, polysaccharides, yeast and bacteria, any grape solids. And you'll also have some soft fining agents, gelatin or isinglass. Uh, these are all insoluble particles. Most of your fluids are gonna have both rigid and soft particles. So I mentioned they're insoluble. If there's anything that's soluble in there, you're not gonna have a lot of removal of insol uh, soluble items in just uh, depth filtration. You're gonna wanna use a fining agent of some sort to pull that out of solution so that you can effectively remove that and you don't have instabilities later when you get to, you get to bottling. How do these particles behave? So your rigid particles are gonna act differently than your soft particles. Rigid particles on the left here, you can see them, they kind of accumulate at, uh, towards the top. They, they could get down in your pores, but they'll accumulate and they'll leave some channels. You'll be able to get your, your wine in between those particles and still utilize that filter. A lot of times soft particles, as you see on the right here, they'll kind of group together, they'll agglomerate and they'll flatten out and they'll just make a, a blocking layer across the top. You're not gonna have those same channels and if you do, they're gonna be a lot less of them. So you're not gonna be able to utilize that filter very well. That's why there's different operating conditions that you should be following. We'll talk about that a little bit later to help them not flatten out so easily. So what's in your soup? You can consider your wine to be like a soup. It's gonna have a combination of, of both rigid and deformable soft particles that are gonna range in size, anywhere from less than 0.2 microns all the way up to say 100 or more micron. The goal is to go from a high solid, high turbidity fluid down to a low solid, very brilliant clarity wine. It's very difficult to do that in one step one filter based on the conventional uh, technology that's out there now. An optimized cross flow, you could probably do it, um, but if you're gonna be blending, uh, doing some blending of your wines, which a lot of people are blending them, you're gonna end up having to do some stability things there, add some bentonite and some of those other things, so you, you might have to then do an additional filtration step. So it's really hard to get it down to one easy step. Um, and I mentioned microns, there's probably I think Dave talked to you guys earlier. He talked about what a micron is. So it's a millionth of a meter, 0. 0.000039 inches. So it's really small. So the main portion of this talk that I'm gonna be talking to you about is depth filtration. Uh, 
that filtration is a thick layer of media and your filtration is going to occur both at the surface and it's going to also, there's channels in that filter. So you can also have some filtration occurring within, within the thickness of that media. So if we look at these pictures down here, this is like a cross section uh, graphic of what a, a depth filter would look like. You've got a little bit more open on the top. It's going to have some big particles kind of surface loading, sticking to the top of your, your media here. You'll also have some particles that'll kind of weave their way through. You'll have it held up in different points here, all the way down, and you get a little bit tighter towards the bottom. That's a gradient density media. So this is like a micrograph of the, of the filter, and you, you can see multiple cellulose fibers just interwoven to, to build that pore structure. Those different pore sizes will hold up different particle sizes, right? So depth filters are all often considered the workhorse. They're, they're made to have a high loading capacity. That's, that's the advantage with depth filtration. You've got all of, this, all of this area of your filter, all the way from the top down to the bottom, that you're trying to utilize to pull out different size particles and use that entire thickness. A disadvantage, it's nominally rated. You're not going to have any absolute rated depth filtration media. That nominal rating is going to be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. Uh, it, it's all dependent on the way that they rate them, the way they test them to do it, uh, the challenge particle that they're using, the operating parameters that they're using to test that, uh, different pressures and flow rates. Uh, that nominal rating is all based on, on those operating parameters as to how effective your sheet's gonna be. We'll touch on that multiple times throughout the presentation. So surface filtration, that's like uh, what Nate and Bill were talking to you about, it's, it's your sterile filtration. It's a real thin layer of media. I say that a lot of that filtration occurs at the surface. Uh, they, they mentioned that there is a tortuous matrix there. It's just much, much thinner. So when you think about depth media, it's uh, an eighth or a sixth of an inch thick. It's real thick. These membranes are very, very thin. So when I'm talking about a tortuous matrix, it's uh, much thicker than, than that membrane. So you're, you're getting a lot more of that um, thickness being utilized to pull out some of those particles. So the advantage, you're getting an absolute micron rating. It's gonna hold the 99.9% .9 or whatever Nate had told you guys previously of that specific particle. Whereas depth filtration, you're not getting that. The disadvantage, it's got that low particle holding capacity. As I mentioned, it's much thinner. So this picture here is kind of showing you this is very thin, you're getting a lot of surface loading. You may have some pores here that are gonna hold on to some of those smaller particles, and then uh, the particles that are smaller than what it's rated for are gonna break through. This is just uh, a micrograph of that as well. And you can kind of see there's, it's a lot more uh, uniform as far as what those pore sizes are compared to the last picture. Um, you don't have as many really big ones and a couple smaller ones in there. It's a lot more uniform than a depth depth filtration. Um, this is very efficient at cleaning up that last, say, 10 cells per milliliter range. Um, that's, that's where it's kind of uh, doing its best work. So in order to, to achieve an economical sterile fil filtration, the best solution is to utilize both of them. You want to have some depth filtration up front, followed by that sterile filtration, surface filtration at the end. That way you can get most of your solids out in the front low, low, uh, portion where it's high particle loading capacity and then you remove that last say 10 cells per milliliter at the end and it's gonna be cheaper that way because your sterile filtration is gonna be more expensive than your depth filtration. Plug up that earlier stuff, use that to get the majority of your solids off. Here's a pretty generic, uh, just kind of ballpark figure of a sequential filtration. So I don't, I don't deal a lot with Lee's filtration, um, but you've got a fermenting wine at say a million cells per milliliter. You've got high grape solids, 5% solids of, of your grape solids, and you're at 200 NTU. You could use a couple different technologies, recessed plate or rotary drum vacuum filters to kind of do that Lee's filtration. Depth filtration that I'm talking about is in these ranges here. You've got your gross solids reduction, that's where you're gonna do your rough filtration. So that's where you're gonna finish getting your, your wine off of those solids so that you don't have your hydrogen sulfides 
uh, forming. You're going to go from 1 million cells per milliliter down to about 500,000 cells per milliliter. You're a great reduction there. You want, you want to get a, a, a lot of your solids off. So you, you're going to still be a little cloudy, um, but your solids are removed. You're going to go from that 200 NTU or so down to uh, around 50 NTU. So maybe you're already down to like 150 after this step or 100. You, you're going to go down to about 50. So then you're going to get into blending, fining, and stabilizing. That's where we're going to do some initial clarification. We're, the goal is to go from, say, that 500,000 cells per milliliter that you attain, uh, attained here and drop that down to, say, 50,000 cells per milliliter. You'll want to use a tighter filter grade, what's considered a polished filter grade, and you're going to start seeing some of that clarity. You're going to drop it from the 50 NTU down to about maybe 5 NTU. And then you can prepare for bottling with that filtration, too. So you'd be doing that sterile prep, dropping from 50,000 cells down to that 9 to 10 cell per milliliter range that I told you that the sterile membrane is most effective at. You use a pre-membrane filter grade, which you can get in uh, depth filtration media. Um, that filtration is going to give you that brilliant clarity and the, uh, the low NTUs. You're going to be down in the 0.5 to 1 NTU range. And then that last step here is that bottling step. So that's your sterile filtration. You're not doing that with, you're not doing that with uh, depth media. But your goal there is to get down to your less than one cell per milliliter and you're starting to see real brilliant sterile wine in the, in the about 0.5 NTU range, right? So that's, that's the membrane filtration that, that Nate was talking to you guys about earlier. So as I mentioned, you can have multiple steps of that, of that depth filtration. Um, so you can remove multiple different uh, particle sizes. You'll you, you want to do a couple different steps. So what is depth filter media made out of? You've got three main parts. You've got cellulose fibers, diatomaceous earth, and then a resin binder. So the resin binder just is the glue that holds everything together. Um, the real open nominal sizes that you're going to see, they may not have diatomaceous earth. It may just be cellulose fibers. So you can get a range of those nominal uh, pore sizes based on using different cellulose fibers, different diatomaceous earths, or none at all, and then the, the combination of how, many, how much cellulose fiber to D, uh, DE is in that filter sheet. So how do they work? What are the filtration mechanisms? So the three, the three main mechanisms are, those particles are just too big. You're going to have some surface loading. They're not going to get down into your pores. So they're going to be trapped on the surface. That's called sieving or surface loading. The second one that we'll talk about is some of those particles, they are, they're small enough. They'll get down into your, into your pores, but they'll come across a point where now they're too big, and they're going to get caught up in that pore, in that channel. It's going to be called uh, entrapment. So that's size exclusion for both of those first two. It's just based on the size of that particle. The third one is adsorption. So there's not a great representation of it here, but say this, this small particle makes it down into this channel. And it comes along, and this is negatively charged, and, and you've got maybe some positively charged resin that's on the side of that, that channel there. The negatively uh, charged particle is going to get down in there, and it's going to just stick to the side of that wall. That charge is going to just hold it in place there, and it won't let it go. Adsorption itself, it doesn't take uh, account for a lot of your filtration. You're going to have most of that adsorption, adsorption taken up in the first 5, 10, 15 minutes of your filtration, and that, that charge is kind of used up at that point. So you're not relying on a lot of adsorption. It's mostly that size exclusion when it comes to depth filtration, but just know that that can happen. So what are some ways to actually utilize depth filters? Very common way is plate filter press. So this is just a picture of a press. I'm sure all of you have seen one or seen pictures of one or used them or you've got multiple plates within the, the press itself. You've got inlets and outlets and pressure gauges. This is the flow duct uh, that you'd see here on your, on your uh, plate. Your fluid's going to flow through there. Here's another look uh, at one of those as well. Um, there's a slit in there that would allow for either entry or exit of your fluid, your wine. And then on the face of that plate is an entry or exit screen as well. And then there's channels, some groove channels in there. So if it was an entry, your wine would come through here and it would go through that little slit. 
and it would come back out this screen and it would run down these groove channels so that it could get all the way across your filter media. You're using the entire surface. Some of the advantages here, it's a consistent performance. As long as you're running within the recommended ranges of, of speed and differential pressure, filtration after filtration, if it's the same exact wine, is gonna be very consistent. You should see very similar performance of your filters. It's lower cost in relation to stacks. You're not paying somebody to put it into that easy to use format. You're not paying for the plastic that it takes to do it. Also in relation to stacks, you've got less waste because of those plastics that you have to consider when you're, when you're going to throw those away. Some of the disadvantages of a filter press. You're gonna have some leakage. It's unavoidable. The way that it's gonna work is your filter is actually gonna be sticking out on the edge a little bit there so that you can seal off in between those plates and have consistent flow through there. Your wine's gonna wick to the edges of that filter and it's gonna drop out. So you can get around that a little bit by putting in a catch and return. So you would just catch those drippings and you could set it up with uh, an outlet and then you just kind of pump it back over and then you just refilter it. Um, but another disadvantage is just the setup time. It takes a lot, a lot of time to go in there and you've got to put every single filter in between those plates and you've got to make sure that those filters are aligned properly based on the, the way you're flowing. And, uh, another disadvantage that I didn't list, it's also kind of a, a more open filtration because of that edge. So you've got a little bit of exposure on that filter to the environment. So here's a flow diagram of, of uh, generic filtration in a filter, uh, filter press. You've got your inlet, and it runs through those uh, flow channels. And then you've got plates, you've got dirty plates. They're called dirty plates because it's unfiltered, unfiltered wine. As it comes through and it runs down that dirty plate and it comes out through your filter and it goes to what's considered a clean plate. It's been filtered, now it's considered a clean plate. It runs over to your other flow, flow channel and out your outlet. It's just a pretty generic run, right? So you, you can also do a multi-step filtration within a filter press. You just get one of these uh, crossover plates and then you could actually do two filtrations in the same run. So you could have two different grades. You could run a coarse filtration and a polished filtration. You just have to know, you know how, you, how you set those filters up within that, that operation. So if we look at the multi-step filter uh, flow diagram here, top view again, you've got the same thing on the front end except for you're running through, you're going through your dirty plates, coming through your filter. Instead of running back out your, closed out, uh, your outlet here, you'd close that one off, and then you'd have your new inlet here because of this crossover plate. So the crossover plate provides a new inlet to your second filtration. Then you have new dirty plates here because they're not filtered through this stage yet. Then it would run through your filter, through your new clean plates, and then out a separate outlet. One thing to consider if you're doing a two-step filtration in one filter press, always set up your operating conditions based on your tighter grade. So you wanna run based off of that so that you're optimized to that filter. It's your last one that you're gonna be running. So you don't wanna be flowing into it too fast and losing your efficiency here because if it plugs here and you don't get it all through, then you basically have to set it back up and, and run again for whatever's left. You're not optimizing the whole thing if you optimize it to this and not to that. Your back end's not as efficient. Another way to utilize depth filter media is lenticular cartridge, so a stack. So it's that same filter sheet, it's just prearranged into an easy to use format that can then be put into a, a fully enclosed filtration. So like I said, it's the same exact media, you can have the same exact nominal ratings. Um, Couple pictures here, we've got a cell here. So each, cell, each layer here that you see, each ring is considered a cell. In that cell you'll have two pieces of filter media, one on top and one on bottom, with a flow separator in between. So you see a piece of filter media, a piece of filter media, and a flow separator. The flow separator is really in there so that as those pressures get higher, eh, your filter's gonna wanna kinda squeeze together gives it that space that it needs, that filtered wine to actually run to that center post and down and out your outlet. For the entire lenticular cartridge, you also have cell spacers. Those go in between each cell, all the way down. 
That's there so that as your wine comes in for the filtration, you have more effective surface area. You have enough space in between there that these layers aren't running into each other and clogging up, and it, you have more effective surface area there. Got a little flow diagram here, a little flow path. You've got an inlet on the bottom of your housing. There tend, there's a, a diverter plate there, so it comes in, it kind of splashes against that a little bit, and it comes up and around so that it's not just running right into the bottom of your filter media. Comes around the outside of your cartridge, your stack, and it goes in between these little areas here, through the filter, either the the top filter or the bottom filter, along the flow separator, down your center post, and to your outlet. Some of the advantages, it's that same consistent performance. I mentioned it, it's the same media, you've got the same type of stuff. As long as you're running the, the correct operating parameters, your filtrations are gonna be consistent. It's gonna be leak free, you're gonna have low loss. You don't have those edges sticking out that you do with your filter press. It's not dripping. You don't have to worry about catching it and returning it. The loss that you'll see is at the bottom here, underneath that diverter plate. You may have a little bit that collects at the bottom of that. But in relation to, uh, if you compare it to what you lose in the leak of a, a filter press, it's, it's much lower. You also have that limited air exposure as you set it up and you do your flushing and your sanitizing. It's all closed off to the environment. So unless there's something introduced in with your, with your wine, it, it doesn't get exposure to that environment, so. It's also a quick and easy setup. You've got it, it, the whole stack is right there, you just pick it up, slide it over your center post, throw that housing on, and it's ready to sterilize and run. Some disadvantages, they're more expensive. I talked about that, you're, you're paying for somebody to put it into that easy to use format and you're paying for the plastic. So there's some extra labor cost there, there's some extra plastic cost, it's just more expensive. They're also sensitive to backflow. So if you're, if you're running your filtration, you're getting to the end and you, say you're pumping it into a, ta a tank that's above where your, your lenticular hosing is, all of a sudden that, that tail end, it comes sloshing back through your pipe and your outlet and it can burst that media. So it's sensitive to that. One way you can avoid that is you just put a check valve in here, so a backflow preventer, so it doesn't come back up through your post and blow your media out. And there's also some more waste disposal with those plastics that we talked about. <clears throat> talked about the quick and easy setup. This is just kind of a, a diagram and talking you through how you can do it. So you just place it right on that center post, and if you're not using all of the area in that center post, say you've got a four high and your batch is half of what you normally are running uh, filtration on, you can throw two stacks on there and you can get a stack adapter. It just closes off that center post, doesn't allow that unfiltered wine to come in through your center post. It has to still travel through, through your media. Then you'd put a following tube on, a spring, and you'd hand tighten that lock nut, close up your housing and you're ready to go. So, even if you're just a small winery starting out, you could, you could get one of these and you could size it bigger than you need so that as you grow and you expand, you don't have to buy another housing. You would just eliminate these spacers or switch the spacers that you have in there to allow more filter media to be placed in there. And it's, it's a, a fairly reasonable way, low cost uh, in relation to buying a whole new housing in case you double your, your production. So this is a, a little bit more inclusive of pros and cons from uh, lenticular versus sheets. Excuse me. So as I mentioned, they both have that full range of filter media, so that's a pro. You're not gonna lose out on, on any nominal rating if you go filter sheet versus lenticular cartridge or, or vice versa. The lenticular cartridge is a lot easier to load. You don't have to worry about orientation. It's already pre-made to have that orientation ready for you. You just slide it on, you're ready to go. It takes a lot more time to load those filter sheets. The footprint, it's a lot smaller footprint in your winery to have a, a lenticular housing. You could have one half the size of this table here compared to uh, a filter press that could be as long as this table that you guys are sitting at to have equivalent uh, filtration the lenticular cartridge has no dripping. We have the leakage, the dripping here. Sealed, more sanitary in a lenticular cartridge. You've got that exposure of your edges in the, in the filter press. The cost here is more expensive per square foot of filter area. It's 
based on the, the cost of putting it into that easy to use format for you. And you've got that lower hold up volume here <clears throat> in lenticular cartridges. So when you're looking to decide between one or the other, there's a lot of things that you need to consider. Um, who are your customers? What kind of wines are you trying to produce? How worried are you, are you about how sterile that wine is <clears throat> Excuse me. after the depth filtration? Are you going right from depth filtration into sterile filtration, or do you want to hold it for a day? You have to worry about that. Uh, if, that's the, if, if you want to hold it for a day before you sterile filter, then maybe lenticular is better because it doesn't have that exposure. You just have a lot of things to consider. Do you have a lot of room or a little room for your filtration? Those types of things. So, Important filtration parameters. The two big ones, flow rate and differential pressure. So your flow rate is basically the speed limit for your filtration. As your filter grade and your pore sizes get smaller, you want to slow that filtration down. The way around speed, if you have to slow down, is surface area. So as you increase your surface area, you can flow faster. You've got more filter uh, to run across, so you, you can run them faster. Differential pressure, I'm sure you've heard this already. It's your inlet pressure minus your outlet pressure. And your pressure is going to increase exponentially as your filtration get, nears the end. So you're going to have a nice, pretty steady pressure, kind of slowly rising, and as it plugs, it's going to curve up and just go through the roof towards the end. So you want to kind of watch it more towards the end. That's telling you that you're just about done. And just remember that, yeah, your flow rate is always dependent on your surface area, how much filter you have. This is a typical application guide of different filter media that you can get from pretty much your sales rep from any manufacturer, you should be able to get this. So this one just kind of talks about coarse filtration, polish or clarifying filtration, and sterile prep pre-membrane filtration. So the three types that I already kind of talked to you about. You've got multiple grades within those areas, and then you should be able to get your recommended flow rates, a maximum flow rate you may get from some people, and what that differential pressure is to operate at. As you, as you can see, the more open top, top of this chart is your more open grades. You've got faster flow rates. The bottom of the chart is tighter. You've got slower flow rates. Your efficiency is dependent on those flow rates and those pressures. So as you go lower flow rate, it's going to allow for better retention. It's going to let those let those particles kind of find those pores at a, a slower rate and get down in there and be more efficient across the depth, the thickness of your media. It'd be like saying if there were a thousand people in this room and you had to have them all run through that doorway as fast as they could, they're going to clog up in there. But if you slow them down and say, let's, let's get through there, and they can all kind of channel in, find their way through, they get there a lot better. So it's kind of the same way when you think about those pores and how your particles are trying to find them and get into them. And, and pressure, uh, as you lower that pressure, it's allowing for better retention. As those pressures get to the higher portion, or even above those max differential pressures, you're going to start forcing some of those smaller particles that are currently being retained in the bottom portion of that filter out into your filtrate. And it's going to go on to your, either your next filter or your sterile membrane. So as you get down to these sterile prep pre-membrane -filtr uh, filtrations, you really, you, that's why you end up having a lower pressure differential. Not only because it's a tighter media, you don't want to run it that much higher, uh, but you don't want to force some of those extra small particles out and then have them clog up your, your sterile membranes. So filter grades and sizes. Um, so I've kind of talked about it already. Your filter grades, you should be able to get multiple, uh, a wide range of nominal retention rates. So. For example, you could go from 0.3 all the way up to 20 micron for your nominal retention. These sizes of filters here, we're talking about surface area for the lenticulars. These are for Gusmer produced lenticulars. You'd have to, if you're using somebody else's, you'd have to ask them what their effective filter uh, surface area is. But for a 12 inch diameter, you can get them in multiple different number of cells. But each of those cells, the, t the, double, the double layer media, is 1.11 square feet of effective area per cell. If you go 16 cells, you end up with 17.7 square feet of filter area. When you go to the 16 inch diameter, it's just a larger 
Same thing, it's just a larger lenticular stack. Each cell is 2.375 square feet. So for 16 cells, you end up getting 38 square feet per, per cartridge. It's a little trickier when you get to filter sheets. There's a lot of different sizes of filter seat, sheets. I picked a, a fairly common one, 40 centimeter sheet. But you have to consider what that edge loss is. As you're loading those into your press, you're gonna have some edges that stick out. It needs to be sealed for your filtration to run right. Those edges that are sticking outside of your seal, they're not providing filtration area. That's just where it's going to drip. So you wanna size your filter right so you don't have excessive uh, filter edge hanging out. But you also have to account for that when you're trying to calculate what your flow rates are. So you can assume a one centimeter edge loss. Um, that's what I would do if you guys decided to send me a bunch of wine for me to optimize your filtration for you if you didn't know what, what your edge loss was. So if you assume a one centimeter edge loss for a 40 centimeter sheet, one sheet is 1.5 square feet of effective surface area. So you have to have <clears throat> quite a few of these sheets to equal one of these stacks just to kind of give you an idea. So that surface area, as I mentioned, is very useful for sizing your system. So you can either figure out how much surface area you need to achieve a certain speed, or you can go backwards. So the initial example here, you want to determine what that recommended flow rate is for that application. So that's, you're going to get that from the application guide. So we'll take a look at a polish filtration. Then you have to determine how fast you want to run that. So for this polish filtration example, let's say we want to run it at 1,000 gallons per hour. You're going to need to determine how much surface area you need to achieve those speeds at those recommended flow rates. So for this polish filter, you're running it at 1,000 gallons per hour at a recommended flow rate of 16 gallons per hour per square feet. So why did I choose that? I'll just go back and I'll show you the application guide. Polish clarifying filter. Typically I would recommend, if it were up to me, I would recommend going somewhere in the middle of this range if you don't know how your wine's gonna filter because it gives you a little bit of leeway one way or the other. Uh, we, I would never personally recommend to run at these max flow rates. You're just not giving your filter the chance it needs to be efficient and do a good job. So I would always pick something in the middle of that. So for this polish, it's right in the middle, 16. You take your 1,000 gallons per hour, you divide it by 16 gallons per hour per square foot, you get 62.5 square feet needed to achieve those speeds at those flow rates. So if you look at a 12 inch lenticular cartridge, that comes up to 3.5 lenticular cartridges are needed to get that square footage based on those calculations we did just on the previous slide. Three and a half, you don't wanna go with three, you're not gonna get all your wine through it. You wanna size it bigger, so you go four. Number of 40 centimeter filter sheets, you come out with 41.6, 42 sheets. So you can see you need a lot of sheets for this in comparison to number of lenticular cartridges because you can get a four high that all fits in one housing, whereas that's gonna be a lot of floor space in a filter press. So you can also do it backwards, I had told you, right? So say you've got 20 40 centimeter filter sheets. That's all the plates you have. That's all you can filter. And you wanna do the same thing. You wanna try and figure out how fast you can run it. So if you've got those 20 filter sheets, comes out to 30 square feet, you're running it at that 16 gallons per hour per square feet, you multiply your surface area by your speed, or your recommended flow rate, and you get your speed you can run. So 16 times 30 comes out to 480 gallons per hour per square foot. So you can see that your surface area allows for faster speeds. Why do you want to slow down? We talked about it a little bit already, but here's an example <clears throat> of a filterability. A wine was run through a pre-membrane filter, uh, same filter, same wine, one wine, five gallons per hour per square foot. The other was at 15 gallons per hour per square foot. Then they tested the filterability of that wine through a membrane. The five gallons per hour per square foot gave you a filterability index of 13, and the 15 gallons per hour per square foot gave you a, a filterability of 21. So mem membrane filterability index, the higher that number, the harder it is to pass it through your membrane. So for reference, the testing that we do, <clears throat> zero to 12, it's good 
filter, filterability. So you're gonna have no problems passing that through your wine if it's zero to 12. Anywhere from above 12 to 25, I believe it is, is considered acceptable, but you may wanna start um, considering optimizing that pre-filtration. Anything above 25 is considered poor filterability and you're gonna definitely have to uh, optimize that, that filtration. So this is right on the edge of good. Uh, it's just past it. If I were to run that test and I see a 13, I'm not gonna worry about optimizing. It's running pretty well. I'm not gonna have a lot of plugging issues on my membrane, we're good to go. 21 is getting to the middle of that high, uh, that acceptable range, middle to high end of that. You're gonna wanna probably start optimizing that because you could be plugging your, plugging your membrane faster than you should. Um, it's just a, a, to show you that based on speed, same exact filter media, same exact wine, you end up with pushing, pushing more of those small particles through and plugging up that membrane faster. So really take a look at your speeds. Why do we wanna monitor pressure? You know what your efficiency is, uh, you can determine your efficiency. So any pressures above that recommended, that, that max differential pressure, you're gonna be pushing those, pushing those uh, particles through, much like uh, flow rates, excessive flow rates. You're, you're losing efficiency there but because you're pushing particles through. Or prematurely plugging too, right? Uh, and to, you can also use it for anticipation. So an increase of differential pressure is showing you that you're starting to plug that filter and you're starting to get towards the end of your filtration. You're gonna need to stop it, change some things out, or maybe slow down to get that last little bit uh, of your wine out so you don't exceed those, those uh, filter pressures. And then you can also util utilize it for optimization. So if you're running your filtration and your pressure differential doesn't change but like one or two PSI through your entire, your entire batch, you're either using the wrong filter or you have way more surface area than you need. So you can optimize that filtration if you, if you don't see that pressure rise. Golden rules of wine filtration. Number one, every wine is gonna filter differently. Kind of depends on what those rough and soft particle ratio is in that wine. What's in your soup like we talked about earlier. Number two, turbidity is not a good indicator of filterability. So it's telling you that you have to filter. There's particles there that you want to remove. It's not telling you what type of particle it is, whether it's rigid or if it's a soft particle. So you don't know exactly how it's going to impact your membrane. Three, speed is not your friend. Four kind of pairs with that. High pressure is not your friend. Those are both efficiency related. We touched on that a lot in this presentation. So. Just always watch your speed and your pressure. And then five, depth filters are considered your workhorse. Let them take out the bulk of your solids. That's what they're made for. Let them do what they were made to do. I've got a couple of little troubleshooting guides for you. I'm not gonna go through these all the way through. It's just kind of like a first glance. Hey, I'm having an issue with a filter press. Say I've got a leakage issue. Maybe there's a find that underlying issue. There could be a poor seal around that media. <clears throat> could just be insufficient filter press tightening. Maybe you just need to tighten that down. It's just leaking way more than I've seen in the past. You, you didn't tighten it as much as you used to. Just, if you're not able to tighten that down, you can get a cheater bar and tighten her down more. Then there's also the lenticular filter troubleshooting. <clears throat> it's the same type of idea. If you've got a leakage at the base of the housing, what could be the underlying issue? The housing's not properly sealed. Maybe you have a torn or misaligned O-ring at that housing base. That's a very common issue. You just wanna double check those uh, O-rings before you set up your filtration, before you start going. So you can download these presentations, you can take a look at these. It's just kinda first, uh, first order of check these out before you get too far into things. With that, that's, that's all I had for you guys. Do you have any questions? How much does the unit cost? Somebody asked me that in the last presentation as well. Um, I don't have solid numbers. I didn't put a slide in there. Um, there's some overlap, and I'd be lying if I told you which one was slightly cheaper than the other, but uh, off the top of my head, I think that the lenticulars tend to, housings tend to be a little bit sm uh, on the cheaper end, but I could be wrong. But I know that there's some overlap. Um, it all depends on your sizing. So, I 
Uh, I'd really probably be lying to you. I'd, yeah, I would talk to your sales rep. Uh, even some of the guys here might be able to give you a better idea than I am. I'm, I'm more on the technical side, you know, developing the filters, optimizing those filters. I'm not so much on the, the equipment end. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Yeah? What is a common rate of leakage for the filter press? A common rate of leakage. It all depends on the type of press you have, the different types of plates. Um, there's different porting, so you can have internally ported presses and externally ported presses. It depends on that press. I don't have a good answer for you on that either. I'm, real, I'm really sorry. Um, you, as, as you run your filtrations <clears throat> and you, I mean, there's even hydraulic presses that always consistently give you that pressure, right? So it depends on how consistent you are with those, those tightening, but I, you're gonna have some leakage. You're gonna see fairly consistently as long as you're, you're always using the same wine and, and the same, uh, same pressures. But I don't know that <clears throat> there's a lot of people out there that'll give you a expected uh, loss in a filter press. All right, thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate it.